Me llamo Eric. No hablo español. <risa> para para hablar bastante bien italiano. Uh, hablo danés, tedesco, escocés, inglés. No, español. I'm very sorry. I do apologize. And it's embarrassing because <clears throat> I was on Facebook yesterday and I was looking at this map and there are lots of pins of places that I have been. And the one city in the world that I've always wanted to visit was Buenos Aires. I've had good friends from Argentina. Uh, I like Argentine beef. <laughs> I used to know how to tango. Uh, and it's a really a thrill to be here. It's really cool to see all of you and that you took a day off from work to, to come and spend some time with me. I'm very honored and I'm very happy. I realize that um, we're all speaking a second language here. If I go too fast or if there's something you don't understand, stop me, okay? If you have questions, let's try and save those for the end so that we don't start too many discussions. But I will also be here this afternoon, so if you have other questions, please ask. Okay? Good. Buenos Aires is a really cool city. <laughs> um, right. So, this is a presentation that I usually give to directors, managers of, of corporations, CEOs, chief executive officers. How many of you are run your own company? Okay, a couple, but not many. So how many of you are middle managers who report to the director? Rather more, okay. So, Assume that this presentation is about how you can explain what you do and why it's important to the people who pay your, pay your salary. <laughs> this is a little boy, and that's a cigar. How many of you smoke? A couple, all right. How many of you have tasted a cigar? All right. How many of you have that reaction to the cigar? Okay, that's a user experience. User experience is not just something that happens on a screen. But part of our problem is that we have trouble explaining to senior managers what this is. What is user experience? It's like trying to catch smoke in your hand. And we're asking for a lot of time and resources and money. And they say, why? Why is this important? So that's what we're going to talk about for the next hour. I used to ask people, why do you have a website? And the answer that I usually get is, well, it's because everyone has one. <laughs> have you heard this before? Yes, okay. So let's change the question a little bit. Why do you have a telephone? Exactly, because everyone has one? No, no, no. It's because we can't do business without it. But of course you come from Telefonica, so you know that. <laughs> We've been rehearsing this for weeks. It's... All right, so let's go back to the first question. Why do you have a website? Because we can't do business without it. This is what we need to communicate to the business community. We're here today, a little select group of people who pretty much understand the importance of this, but we're not very good, none of us, myself included, at explaining to the rest of the business world why we do what we do and how it's going to earn them money, because ultimately that's what it's about. Let me share some information with you. First of all, most business leaders turn to the internet as their first source of information. And this has been true for many years now. This is not a new fact. It started in around 2007. That was the tipping point. That's when people started to go online 
rather than rely on their own local research uh, within their company or newspapers or brochures or so on. Second, business to business, strangely enough, is the fastest growing segment within this community. Thirdly, there are over 50 billion searches for commercial information every month. That's a lot of searches. And I think it's probably a lot more than that, because these are the figures that Google publishes, but we also have Bing and MSN, and we have a lot of other, uh, other places where people get information. And then finally, and this is important, Argentina has the highest rate of internet penetration in South America, 67%. This is higher than any other country in not just South America, but Latin America, with the exception of Barbados and Antigua, but they don't count, so. <laughs> Spanish is the third most popular language on the internet. You, in Argentina, are uniquely positioned to take advantage of this. You have the talent, you have the bandwidth, you have the people, and you have the connectivity that is necessary so that you can truly become leaders in this. Now yesterday, when we were talking about this at Kaikendo, I was asked, so where is Brazil? Well. You have to remember that, you know, outside of Rio and Sao Paulo, Brazil is jungle. A lot of people, but they don't have a lot of connectivity up in the Amazonas. So they're not up at the top. We hear a lot about Brazil. But if I ask people at home in Denmark, where I come from, name a country in South America, Argentina is often top of the list. You're a very special country. And very special people. And the fact that you are perhaps more European in your attitude than many of the other countries in South America also gives you a unique opportunity to communicate both with the stupid Nord Americanos and with the Europeans. And if you don't believe it, these are the statistics. So Argentina has 67% and Brazil is at 39%. Chile, they're pretty high. Now this one at 92%, that's the Malvinas, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> I was told not to talk politics, so, so I'm not talking politics at all here. <laughs> so, what is UX? What is this smoke that we can't grasp? How are we expected to communicate with business leaders if we can't explain what it is we do? So, let's start with user. A user is a person who makes use of a thing, someone who uses or employs something. And then we've got you know, people who take drugs and all that kind of business. That, we're not talking about that. And then we have experience. Experience having been affected by or learned through observation or participation. And we don't care about the length of the participation either. So those are the definitions. So this is my first law of user experience. If a site does not solve your user's problems, it's not going to solve your company's either. You have to make your users happy. They are the people who are paying the bills. We think the CEO is signing the checks, but the checks don't bounce when they go to the bank because we have customers. We have people who buy our products, our services, or support our ideas in one way or another. So let's start with the user. Now, I apologize for all the bullet points. There are lots of big words here. What would you use all at the same time, simultaneously? An ergonomic seat designed for one person, optical lenses invented by Benjamin Franklin, an alcoholic mixture invented by Dr. Ian Marshall, an incandescent device invented by Thomas Edison, fabric made on a lube invented by J.M. Jacquard, Rouge Royale, Baskerville Light, a domesticated mammal. How many of you got all of that? Nobody. Good. Fine. Because this is the way clients talk to us. This is how they see their content. 
This is how they perceive the things that are important for them. And part of the user experience, what we do is to try to make this understandable. What is this? This is crazy. And how do you combine all of these elements together? Let's change the words a little bit. We have an armchair. We have bifocal eyeglasses. We have a Manhattan cocktail, a light bulb, a pullover, sweater, a tabletop, a book, and a cat. All right? That makes more sense, yes? Wasn't that easier to understand than all this? This is true. This describes this, but they're not quite the same. So let's put a picture on it. And there we have it. And we have an armchair, and we have a Manhattan, and eyeglasses, and a light bulb, and a wool pullover, and a marble tabletop, and Gus the cat. And in terms of user experience, what are all these things contributing? Well, let's look at this. We have convenience, comfort, that's the chair, chemical stimuli, sensory assistance, the lamp, the eyeglasses, warmth, comfort, the pullover, education and information, and companionship. Suddenly, that crazy list starts to come together in a very sensible way. And that's the user experience that we need to describe. This is the user experience that we need to communicate when we're working on our products. And it doesn't matter whether it's online or offline. User experience happens everywhere. The user experience today, was it difficult to find the Hotel Continental? Did you like the coffee? Uh, was it difficult to register for the conference? All of these things are interactions that affect the way in which we experience things. A user experience can be bad as well as good. It's our job to make sure that it at least provides value. So, we also have to remember that needs are situational. For example, if we're at a high-class restaurant and we want water, then it's very nice that we have ice in the, in, in, in the glass and we have this lovely frosted bottle and it's very elegant. But if we're trekking through the desert and we're very thirsty, we will drink our own urine. <laughs> so we need to keep that in mind too because user experience for one person will probably not be the same as that very same set of stimuli for someone else. So we need to keep in mind what is the scenario? Who are the persona who are using what we're creating? This I thought was an extremely good definition from this morning when Juan was, uh, uh, was, was discussing it. And it in fact is, I hate to admit it, an ISO standard but it is actually pretty good. Now, the, the important part is right back there because he talks about uh, efficiency and e effectiveness, efficiency, and then down here, satisfaction. And satisfaction is really what it's about. This is the area that we're concentrated on. Screw the fact that it talks about usability. That's part of the picture. But it's satisfaction that I'd like to talk about now. So my second law of user experience is that it is the sum of a series of interactions between people, devices, and events. And the events can be processes, they can be all kinds of things. Maybe it's two servers that are talking to each other. They're two devices that are talking, but that means that the download time for the app on the mobile phone is slow. And we know that after three seconds, 57% of the people who are trying to download something are going to go away. So suddenly, that user experience has a direct effect on the bottom line. Are you taking notes? <laughs> Very important stuff. And my third law is there are three types of interaction. There are active, passive, and secondary interactions. So let me go through these very quickly. Oh, there's a fourth law, yes. <laughs> what we're doing is the conscious attempt to choreograph these events. In other words, we want to acknowledge interactions, we want to reduce negative interactions. That's what we do. 
So let me show you how this plays out. So active, these are things that we can control. Okay. Then we have passive interactions. These are the things that we don't control. And then the secondary things, they're, they're things that have an indirect influence. How many of you eat food? All right, there are several of you who didn't raise your hands. I'm kind of wondering what, you're, <laughs> what you live off of. How, what do you eat when you, since you don't eat food? Um, so let's take a restaurant for an exam, as an example. Now, we start with a menu. This is an active interaction between us and the menu. Can we find what we're looking for? Or does it appeal to us? Do we, can we read it? Do we like the design? That's an active interaction between us and something printed, ink on paper. We can have an active interaction with the waiter who takes our order. These are active interactions. And also the person who seated us and, 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 and the busboy who pours water and so on. Now, there are also passive interactions. Maybe we have a fantastic view. We can't really control that, but it's there and it's, redu it's releasing dopamine up in our limbic system in our head and so we feel good. Or there's a fabulous sunset. And that makes us feel good, too. It makes most of us feel good. Not everybody, but most people. And then we have secondary interactions. The food is good because the chef prepared it well. And other secondary interactions can be, well, the chef also chose good ingredients. But because these tomatoes are good, the pasta tastes good, and we are happy at the restaurant. So these are all interactions. We're interacting with the food, but the food has been through several interactions before that. So we can control the, the final experience by making sure we have a good chef who buys good ingredients and so on. So the total experience is the sum of these things. So we want to coordinate interactions that we can control. We want to acknowledge interactions that are beyond our control, and we want to reduce the negative interactions. So coordinating interactions, do we want a menu like that, or do we want a menu like that? It's all sending out a signal. This is all part of the experience. This restaurant is very different than that restaurant. We're not making a judgment here. One is not better than the other, but we are making a conscious decision in terms of what are we trying to communicate to the people who look at that menu. Coordinating interactions. Here they're learning to become sommeliers, wine tasters in South Africa, so that they can advise people in restaurants as to which wines they should drink. Coordinating interactions. We're buying fresh fruit, but also we want to make sure that we reduce negative interactions. So if they're sold out of something that we need, we have a plan B. We reduce negative interactions. Nobody wants to sit at that table at a restaurant. So that's the last place you want to put people. So it's a question of training the staff that that's where you put people. And to make a good experience in a restaurant, you want to pe put people up by the front, by the window, so that the people who are walking by on the street say, ooh, this looks like a nice restaurant. It looks popular. I mean, the rest of the restaurant may be, may be empty but you still want to convey a good impression. All of this helps form user experience. We have blankets at cafes so that people will stay longer when it gets cold in the evening. We're reducing a negative interaction. We can't change the weather. We can't stop it from becoming cold. We can't stop it from raining, but we can at least make these situations better. So that is user experience. That's why they pay us, so we can do a better job of looking at all of these touch points and finding out what do we need to do so that we can make this experience better because ultimately this is going to earn us more money. Right. Now let's talk to those CEOs. First, don't confuse marketing with communication. This is the model that many marketers use. How many of you come from a marketing background? None of you. Oh, uh, <laughs> now don't be ashamed, dear. I, it's, it's, 
Listen, you're looking at somebody who played piano in a whorehouse once, you know. So I mean, talk about things that are. There's there's a uh, Mita Rang's um, uh, communication secretary, uh, Jacques uh, Zigula, said, "Don't tell my mother that I work in marketing. She th or in advertising. She thinks I play piano in a whorehouse." <laughs> And I'm one of the very few people in the world that has actually played piano in a whorehouse and also worked in advertising. So, <laughs> and I, believe me, my mother was much happier when I moved to advertising. <laughs> so this is a model that we know, and it's kind of like a funnel. It's called the AIDA model. And it's basically awareness, interest, desire, and action. <laughs> And if you're doing a direct mail, for example, you know, awareness, or if you're looking through a magazine, you have 1.7 seconds to catch people's attention while they're going through the magazine. So you want a headline, or you want a picture, or you want something that's going to catch people's attention. Then you want to come with a message that's going to generate interest. And if we're doing direct mail, then we have to create desire and give, give people a course of action. The reason the advertising agency, how many, there's some people from Wunderman here. Uh, <laughs> ah, you decided to, welcome. <laughs> the advertising agencies generally don't get this because the concept offline is look and feel and the concept online is very much what something can do. And all of the things that make us brilliant in advertising are exactly the same things that destroy us when we try to go online. And part of the problem is that there's a line that runs through this. When people type in our URL, our web address, they're not there by accident. We don't have to create awareness or interest. They have already displayed, either by clicking on a link in Google or by typing in the URL, that they're interested. Our job is to create desire and give people a course of action, to create forms that they can fill out so that they can respond to us. And many of the advertising agencies still think, the art directors in particular, think that we have to make the website look like our print ads. And so they fill it up with headlines that are meaningless or pictures that are meaningless or they've created a style guide that works offline that doesn't work online at all. Again, it is what is the definition of a concept? And if you talk to developers, their definition of concept is something quite different. It's much more structural in character, rather than the function that we talk about in terms of UX or the look and feel that the advertising industry and the creative directors talk about. So it's a confusing industry. What you want to be doing is making sure, though, that your online presence is part of your total customer service package. All of this needs to work together. It's not about marketing. It's about communication. It's making sure that all of this is going in the same direction. We have offline, we have online. We're going to bring this together. And right there in the middle, that's where we have customer experience management. And that's kind of what we're talking about. Now, Theoretically, a customer is somebody, by definition, who is going to give you money. But that's also a good reason for perhaps calling customers users, because there are people who use the system who didn't necessarily buy the system. So although there is a lot of debate, particularly in North America, where they think, whoo, user is so old-fashioned. We don't like the word user. Ignore that. Because basically, we have people who are using our system. It is not a bad word. Offline, there's a fellow by the name of Paco Underhill. Are any of you familiar with him? Oh, Santiago. You're such a show off. Uh, Paco Underhill is really cool. He kind of invented. Uh, what's called mystery shopping. In other words, you know, they sort of discreetly follow people around and see how many items they touched before they actually picked one up. And uh, 
you know, all kinds of things. He knows more about how, shopping patterns than anyone else on earth. And he's written three or four books. They're all very good, and they're probably available in Spanish. That's, they're very popular. Uh, some of this I've also worked on, and I can't honestly remember which bullet points are his and which are mine at this point. But let me, these are ten things that people will tell you if you go into a store and ask them. First, don't tell me how great you are. Be great. Go the extra mile. Make that extra effort. Don't get in my way when I'm trying to shop. Can I help you? Can I help you? Can I help you? <laughs> if I know what I'm looking for, help me find it. If I have questions, give me straight answers. Not a sales talk. If you're going to go off and look for my size, tell me you're going to go off and look for my size and don't just sort of leave. It happens a lot. If you expect me to buy something, tell me what it costs. And are your own affairs so important that you feel justified in making... <laughs> We've all experienced this. Don't make me feel stupid. I, I, maybe I am stupid, but you don't make me feel stupid. And if you make a mistake, admit it. It's really difficult to be mad at somebody who has just apologized. It's a <laughs> sort of the one, number one lesson in customer service. And it's amazing how many companies don't realize this. If you fuck up, tell people you fucked up. <coughs> All right. Now you're saying to yourselves, hey, you know, most of us are working in interactive media. Why is he boring us with all this stuff? Let me show you how this plays out. I did a talk for the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. And they knew that I was interested in California wine. And uh, the professor at the university was kind enough to send me this bottle of wine from the Mount Beter Winery. Now, I have a book in Denmark that tells about wine, except that the Mount Beter winery was not included. So I figure, all right, I can see that it came from wine.com, so I'll go to wine.com, and then I'll be able to find out about this wine. Now, you would expect that this is the way it would look if you went to wine.com, but no. In fact, you get this. What state will you be shipping to? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not shipping anywhere. I just want to read about wine. I tried a long time to get past the screen, and I'm pretty good at gaming the system. I mean, that's part of my job, is trying to screw up other people's websites and find out why they don't work. I couldn't do it. So my mother had a house in Florida, so I type in Florida. Well, <laughs> we currently ship to most locations in Florida, but due to state and local regulations, there are certain areas, blah, blah, blah. Please enter your zip code. <sighs> So I give them a zip code. And then they did decide to explain to me why I had to go through. Well, because wine availability and pricing may vary from state to state due to the way interstate commerce laws influence our buying patterns. I don't give a flying fuck about your <laughs> buying patterns. That's your problem, not mine. We have found that the select state layover screen, while a little intrusive, <laughs> a little intrusive? I've been on this site 10 minutes and I haven't even seen a bottle of wine. I hate them. I hate them. It's a terrible user. Little intrusive. Almost entirely eliminates the chance of customers being disappointed by the way they're... <laughs> Who dreams this up? 
This is the way Americans think, because it's alcohol. And you know, heaven forbid that somebody who's underage or that you should order it on a Sunday or whatever. Okay, so don't get in my way when I'm trying to shop. And are your own fares so important that you feel justified in ignoring me? Okay? There's a parallel here, and it's important to remember. And for CEOs, all the things that made them successful in one area are also the things that can make them successful online. They just need to get over their fear of what we're presenting them with. If we can explain user experience to them, they will also sign the check. Now, so now I'm in, and you can see here it says ship to Florida. Now, if we look at the top here, Ranked the number one online wine store by Internet Retailer Magazine, 2005, 2006, 2007. <clears throat> it turns out that Internet Retailer Magazine only reviewed one online wine shop. <laughs> so by default, it's also, it ranked last. <laughs> the point, though, is don't tell me how great you are. Be great. Okay, so I get in and I know that the professor who sent me the wine is not, doesn't really know a lot about wine, so it's probably bottles that are great to give. I'll click on that. And I get 70 <coughs> wines, all kinds of different prices, absolutely no order whatsoever. Yeah, bottles that are great to give. Basically, any bottle is great to give. This is not very helpful at all. So I can go to the search engine. Well, if I know what I'm looking for, help me find it. They're not doing that. I go to the search engine. And uh, actually, I did find Mount Veeder. But just for fun, I, I tried something else, something called Bear Boat, which is a Pinot Noir from Washington State, or from Oregon. Really, really good wine. And it says, please double check your spelling and shipping state and try again. <laughs> because there were no results. Sorry, we couldn't find any matches. Don't make me feel stupid. I've already gone through all of this with the shipping state. You know my shipping state. You let me in. Why do you suddenly think that it was my fault that you can't find a wine on your own website? OK. So here's Mount Veeder. And it's interesting because here we have two links that are absolutely identical. And uh, the first one has all kinds of stuff from Mount Veeder, and the second one actually has information about the winery. But in terms of user experience, why should I click on one rather than the other? This is not very, and by, print seller notes. How many of you, do you know what seller notes are? No? Seller notes are what you print out, or what you write in a book, and you put it with the bottle, when you store it, and you know that in a couple of years' time, and then you look at the seller notes and say, oh, well, it's time to drink the wine, or this is a wine that's particularly good with, with meat or uh, with spicy foods, or no, you should save this another couple of years, whatever. This is why you print seller notes. So if we click on print seller notes, this is what we get. And uh, it says almost nothing about the wine. And then it says customers who bought this also bought a shitty champagne from California. I, I'm sorry, th this is not collaborative filtration. I, I'm, you know, I've, I've got a piece of paper, and I'm going to poke at this as though I can buy a bottle of Charles Heitzig Root Reserve? This is crazy. In fact, down here, way at the bottom, that's the stuff that I'm interested in. That's what I want in my seller notes, but they're making me print out actually almost well, it's just over two A4 pages to get it all in. Bad design, bad user experience. Something else interesting, please notice the price. $36.99. These are American dollars. But on the previous page, it was $43.99. And it turns out you can buy it everywhere on the internet for much less. So if you expect me to buy something, tell me what it costs. Okay, why do people abandon shopping carts? Any ideas? Because people do abandon shopping carts. They put all kinds of things in shopping carts and then they leave. 
97% of people abandon shopping carts. No. No. Well, I mean, some of them do, yes, but there's, there's, there's another more important reason. Thank you. That's exactly the answer. That is how we find out the shipping price. Now, these people have already, they know within three kilometers where I live. They have asked for my state. They have asked for a postal code. Why can they not tell me what it costs to ship a bottle of wine? So, I will add something to the cart and I will start the checkout. And they want my email address and they want my date of birth because they're crazy Americans and I have to be over 21. I fill all of this out. Then they want a credit card and I realize, oh my god, I'm now in the shopping cart. I didn't just register for the site, now I'm about to buy something. That makes me nervous. That makes me nervous. And a shipping address, and oh, I can write a, a gift card to myself. And then finally, I get to a page and it says, yeah, wow, this is great. It costs $43.99, the expensive price. And it says, standard, estimated arrival, seven business days, $9.95. Now I ask you, what are seven business days? A week is seven days. But seven business days, is that a week and a half? Or and apparently they think I'm really, really stupid because priority, estimated arrival, seven business days, <laughs> add $10. <laughs> or express, six business days, add $15. This is, this is absolutely nuts. Worst user experience ever. So I say cancel order and I get a 404 error. <laughs> You don't want to be giving this to the marketing people, okay? That's kind of the message. But on the other hand, you don't want to view a website or your UX uh, as a software development project. This is also dangerous. Um, I have a special version of PowerPoint. All right, see, bar jokes. Uh, in, uh, particularly in the United States, there are lots of jokes that start with, a man walks into a bar and says, you've heard these, okay? This is a tweet from last night. A product manager tries to walk into a bar but can't because the door isn't scheduled until the next release. <laughs> I thought that was very nice. <clears throat> um, we've all seen books like this with specification documents. And unfortunately, writing the specification documents often costs more than actually doing the project, which is a problem. Um, I've had to say no to projects that I really wanted because there was no budget left. Everything had been used on creating these books. And why do we have the books? Because we use them to hit each other over the head when we go to court and says it doesn't work. I had a client who had outsourced a project to India. Big, big, big book. And I had read it and um, it it was, it was a terrible specification. But anyway, they said, so they sent this to Bangalore and they have a whole team of Indian developers and then the software comes back and it doesn't work. And at which point the client calls me and says, well, you have to talk to the Indians and find out why this isn't working. So I call India and they said, yes, well, we did what you asked us to do. And say, so, yeah, but it doesn't work because blah, blah, blah. Yes, yes, but it says on page 57 that we should do such and such. <laughs> And this is what we have done. I say, but it doesn't work. And say, oh no, it would never work that way. I say, then why did you do it? Because it says so on page 57 that we should do. <laughs> this is unfortunately not a unique occurrence. And this is why I think it's incredibly important that you bring in developers at the earliest possible moment so everybody becomes part of the team and you don't have this handoff between the so-called creatives or the information architects and the people who are actually going to be doing the code or implementing the software. This is a really important thing. This is a Dell computer, very fancy computer. These are the specifications. It's very fast. It's got a lot of RAM, CD, blah, 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 blah. That's the specification. 
using these specifications, in theory, you could build this. Now that's probably not what Dell had in mind, but it fits the specifications. You see where things go wrong. You know, we have this up in our heads. This is what we want. And then we have all of these documents. And then we end up with something like this. And everybody's upset. And it's cost a lot of money. And we're behind schedule. <coughs> and everybody hates everybody. I urge you not to treat it as a software development project. It is a software implementation project. That's very different. None of you are going out and coding your own word processing program. You're using something from Linux, you're using something from Microsoft Office. And there's nothing wrong with that. This is interesting, and this is also one of the reasons why the developers have to be in early. What is this a picture of? Why did I include it? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a taxi, taxi meter. So 666, is that expensive or is it inexpensive? What? Exactly. Well, it's in Chinese yuan, which is actually very cheap. And the reason the picture was taken was that 666 in the Christian Bible means the beast and Satan, and it's a very unlucky number. And in Asia, 666 is a very happy number. Okay? So it's an interesting photo, but if you don't understand the background, and if you don't understand the context, then it's meaningless. And a lot of these specification documents become meaningless because the people who wrote them are completely removed from the people who are actually being asked to implement things. So I urge you all to work together as a team. You will do things faster, cheaper, and you will create better user experience. Food, very nicely arranged on the plate. Is this a good restaurant? Looks that way, cloth tablecloth, nice silverware, nice plate. <laughs> But we don't know whether they are making good food or not. Was the specification good or not? Is this Argentine lamb or is you know some crap from Paraguay? You know, oh, I didn't say that. <laughs> Sorry. Any of you from Asuncion? No. Good. Fine. Look at this. In one of the most high-tech areas in the world, the modern airport, the best way we know to keep airplanes parked at their stands is still a hunk of wood with a piece of rope attached. And there's nothing wrong with that. We don't need to make things more complicated than they are. There's a Danish architect by the name of Paul Henningsen who, this is a picture of him from 1927. This is a bent wood chair from the company Tone, which is, at that time was in Czechoslovakia, now the Czech Republic. And he said, if you make this chair five times heavier, twice as expensive, half as comfortable, and only a quarter as beautiful, an architect can make a good name for himself. And it's true. You can ruin this chair and create something that will create a name. You don't want to do that. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're trying to provide a good experience. We need to get our egos out of this and to think about the people who are actually using the product. That also means that whenever possible, purchase software from single focus vendors, from people who have a specialty, people who know how to do a search engine, people who know how to do a shopping cart, people who know how to do an online content management system. I have another picture that relates to this in just a second. So the third thing is don't couple unrelated initiatives. This is a big problem because the CEOs say, well, it's all on a screen, so um, why don't we do just a whole bunch of things? And the thing is that these are all very different. You you're either publishing or you're tracking customer data or you're trying to optimize the use of people and materials. You have a filing system or you're trying to e share experience within the company. Uh, uh, this is kind of the essence of most intranets. SharePoint does this very well. SharePoint does not do that very well. So try not to couple these unrelated uh, uh, initiatives, and the CEOs do this all the time. 
because they think, well, it's something for the IT department, and it isn't. This is not a particularly good table setting. And the thing is, uh, the Parker people make very good pens, and George Jensen in Denmark makes very nice silverware, and Bacho in Sweden makes good wrenches, and Dr. Scholz has nail clippers. These are all fine tools, they're just not being combined correctly. They all have a single focus, and you need to find the single focus that applies to your project, not to somebody else's project. And if you try to combine things, you will invariably end up with some kind of a Swiss Army knife that is not going to do the job. So do one project and just that project, and then you can take care of the other stuff and stick to the single focus vendors. This goes directly to your question. Uh, during Juan's uh, talk, you talked about, you know, how do we measure the, the, the efficacy of what we're doing? I can't, uh, Jose, Luis? Yeah, right. I don't have my glasses on. You have got to set measurable goals. We are not doing this just because it's fun. It's not just smoke. There, it is something measurable. This is incredibly important. You know, there, was a, there was a movie in the United States, Field of Dreams, that said, well, if you build it, they will come. And the truth is, that's not the way it works. They're not going to come. Let's talk about airlines. I did a lot of service work for airlines back in the 1980s. And um, what, what is the most important thing for an airline to do if they're going to provide good service for you? What? Flying on time. This is certainly what the airlines think. I spent three days at Heathrow Airport back in 1984, five, interviewing passengers. Now, I had a list of 30 things that we expected passengers to want in terms of service. But what did they say? Why publish schedules if I can't use them? I plan meetings, I book connecting flights, I have people waiting to pick me up. I said, you're supposed to fly on time. This is not a service metric. Faster check-in. Better food, more leg room. On time, that's your job. It came as a big surprise. We thought that flying on time was important. It is, but they, people don't perceive that as being good service. They perceive that as us doing what we promised to do all along. Now, when we talk to people who don't know very much about what we do. They say, well, we want more hits, and we want people to spend more time on our site, and we want people to write to us. How many of you have heard these things? I want to see every hand here, because you have. If you haven't, you haven't been in this business long enough. These are the metrics that a lot of marketers and a lot of CEOs think are important, and they're not. We want better lead qualification, we want a shortened sales process, we want to streamline our logistics, and we want conversions. We want more hits. Look at how many people have clicked through our ad on AdWords. <coughs> hey, I got news for you. The only people who get rich when you click on AdWords is Google. The conversion happens on your site, not theirs. If people can't fill in your form, then there's a problem. If people can't communicate with you, there is a problem. If people don't understand what you're asking for, there is a problem. This is my first time in Argentina. The, the customs form makes no sense whatsoever for somebody who has not been to Argentina before. It says we, you have a $300 uh, deduction uh, for all used items. I said, please list everything that was purchased abroad. I think. Yeah, that's like pretty much everything I have with me. <laughs> Where do I start? And I'm supposed to register my cell phone or whatever. I, at which point I sort of gave up and I gave them a passport number and whatever. And of course, when I handed it in, nobody looked at it. I mean, there are probably police waiting for me outside and they'll arrest me and <laughs> I'll never see any of you again. But it, the, the point is, there was a lack of a shared reference here. Um, and um, it wasn't that I was trying to be difficult with the Argentine government or the customs officials, I just didn't know what they expected me to do. Uh, so this is what we need to be working on, and we need to put metrics in place and say, this is how we're making money. 
And we also have to make sure that we are crossing the swim lanes. Maybe we don't need a bigger marketing budget, but we need to reallocate the money from one channel to another channel. Maybe we need to take some out of our print and put it into community management and take care of social, social media and some other things. There are a lot of ways this can go. So insist that user experience becomes an integrated part of your company's business activities. This is incredibly important because this is where the money is. Personal needs and those of your visitors. This is a problem. This is a problem. These are the things that I generally hear. We need pictures of ducks. I like ducks. <laughs> oh, oh, look what they just did. Oh, oh. Or we should talk about innovation. Everybody's talking about innovation. Why do we not talk about innovation on our side? Oh, we need an app. We need an app. Or that change doesn't fit our design manual. So this is the kind of stuff that we fight with all the time. And it's all wrong. And it's up to you as the first line of defense, as the people who took a Wednesday off here in Argentina to come and sit and listen to this. When you go back to your offices, these are the messages that you need to understand. This is the way a lot of the leaders are thinking. They're scared of what we do. They don't understand it, and we need to help them. <laughs> Basically, we want to tell our story. This is, this is what we want to do as clients. But the people who are visiting our sites say, right, I, I got what I came to get. I, I changed my, my, uh, uh, my, my, my telephone account. I updated my, my credit card. I did whatever it is. I found the information I needed. We want to be understood and say, yeah, OK, I got the message. I understand this. We want to be believed and say, OK, sounds reasonable. We are the largest blah, 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 blah in all of South America. We have the highest interrate penetration rate of any country in South America, which is true. It's true. We want to be trusted. And say, OK, I'll give you a credit card number. I'm willing to share my email address with you, all of these things. These are close, but they're not the same. And then finally, we want to build loyalty. Say, so, yeah, I'll come back. And you could actually add another one, and that is we want them to tell their friends that we're a nice company to deal with, or we have good ideas, or we have good service, or whatever. And all of this is not to lead up to a good experience, but to lead up to a valuable experience. Not all experiences are good, but it's our job certainly to see that people are getting value out of what we do. If you don't meet the needs of your visitors, you will never meet your own business needs. We talked about this before. It's as simple as that. So you need to encourage research and accept things that go against what you thought. This isn't opinion-based design. This is knowledge-based design. And there are enough case stories out there that you can find things that back up what you're doing and to explain or at least to lead you so you know what's good and what is not good. Opinions are fine, but you know if the CEO wants ducks on the on the home page, what makes your opinion better than his? The question to ask is, would your clients like to see ducks on the cover? Doesn't matter what we think. Our business cards are orange. I don't like orange, but they are. And uh, and our creative director gave me a long explanation for why we should do this, and he was right. It's not a question of whether I like orange or not. I think our business cards are silly, but they've been extremely effective. They have ducks on one side, you know, rubber ducks. OK, it's not a fixed term project. This is also a problem. Well, we gave you half a million uh, uh, pesos last year, and now we're going to allocate it to something else this year. You've already done your website or your app or whatever. This is a bad thing. We have a process that we call the 7A. It starts with allocate. In other words, what do we have in terms of time and money and people? Then we analyze the situation. Then we can start to figure out how are we going to structure it and apply our knowledge in terms of applied design. What are we trying to accomplish? Accumulate the content and the other things that are necessary. Glue it together. 
And then finally, make sure that we adjust it. We keep doing iterative testing to make sure that it all works. And it's a circular process because as soon as you're done there, you need to start this again. It goes on and on and on. So once you start the process, make sure that you keep it going. This is incredibly important and this is a message that the CEOs just don't understand. They think that, well, you know, it's like printing a brochure. And it isn't. It's a living product. And if you abandon your interactive media, even for short periods, you may destroy it. It is something that needs to be nurtured. It's like a house plant. You need to give it water. All right? uh, if, you, if you don't take care of it, it's going to die. And interactive media can die pretty quickly. Print design and online design. We all know this. As uh, Santiago told me yesterday that he had a, a design specification from a Spanish advertising agency that said the content needed to be uh, 457.4 pixels wide. You should be laughing at that. Of course, it is, it is sad. I mean, what the hell is 0.4 pixels? I mean, it makes no sense. Let me show you a Danish site. This is for a company called Novozymes, and they uh, rethink tomorrow. That is their, their tagline. So obviously, we all know what Novozymes does. What, you don't? No? Oh, is it a language thing? Yeah. Because, I mean, I think they're being pretty clear here, you know, rethink tomorrow, you know. What else could they do? Okay, all right. Well, I'll humor you. We'll click on products and solutions, and we get this. Uh, big use of picture and some things we can click. Products and solutions. So apparently we are on the products and solutions page, and if we click on biologicals, then uh, we get more nonsense, and we click on products for the second time, and now I get drop downs, and then I click on agriculture, and oh, for crying out loud, so I'll click on biofertility, and so finally, seven clicks into this site, I get to some content. Okay, this is a question for you guys from Wonderman. How many of you are art directors at Wonderman? None of you? You are. Okay. Tell me. What's wrong with this design in terms of it being a, uh, a website? Well, that's certainly one of the main problems. There's something else. I'm thinking more in terms of layout. Anybody else want to, There is a, 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 a really curious layout problem with this page. <laughs> Well, uh, that, excuse me? Well, the shapes are a little stupid, but uh, let, 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 me, let me help you a little bit. I'll put this in browser Chrome. What do you have to do? Right, but worse than that, let's move this up a little bit. Um, the thing is that this is a two column design. This is a print design that has made its way to the web. And there's nothing wrong with the design, it just doesn't work in this medium. Because it's forcing me to start reading there, then I have to scroll back, and then I can read down there. And this is the kind of stuff that looks great in a design manual. And I've been guilty of this kind of, well not this, but other mistakes of a similar character. Because I grew up in advertising, I, I did Print for years and years and years. And things that look good suddenly don't work because it's not a question of look and feel. So this is a crazy site. And it's a stupid thing to do. And I'll tell you, there's a, an advertising agency in the UK or a design agency. They got 1.5 million pesos to do the design guide to figure out that all those shapes should be and how many angles. I think it's crazy. I think it's absolutely crazy. So there are three things that we're really trying to do. Content, this is what we want people to know. This is not rocket science. It's not difficult. This is what we want people to know. Function, this is what we want people to do. 
And brand is what we want people to remember. That's the essence of user experience. If we can get these things to work, the business will be happy and the users will be happy. It doesn't have to be difficult. Rosser Reeves, who invented the Marlboro Man, big advertising man in the United States, says, do you want art or do you want your sales curve to go up? And ultimately, we should be wanting the sales curve to go up. It's not a question of whether we think it's pretty. And user experience is not a question of sprinkling pretty dust on what we do. There are a lot of people who say, right, well, we have a website. We need a little UX. It's like, what? It's not like salt and pepper. Uh, but this is what we need to work on. We need to acknowledge and embrace best practices that may run counter to what is in the design guide or what we think is best. Or as somebody who was a creative director at an advertising agency, to, to unlearn some of the things that I used to do because I'm working in a different medium that doesn't, will not accept some of the things that were best practice when I was doing offline. Don't let personal opinion cloud your focus. Is this a better site than this one? They're both selling hiking boots, about 125 US dollars. Which one of these is better? Which one of them sells more shoes? Any ideas? This one? The other one, why? It looks cleaner, okay. How many of you like this one? See some hands. Not so many of you, okay. And how many of you like this one? You think that's better? Well, it's about 50-50. What is the first thing you do if you're going to buy... How, how many of you go hiking? Go walking? You, know? you do, okay. If you were going into a shoe store, what would you look for if you were looking at a boot? Exactly. This, but you would look at the sole because that's the traction, that's the important part. This site does not sell very well. Here, they flip the boot so you can see what's underneath. They're creating a shared frame of reference. It's not a question of whether we think that this is prettier. This is a question of building up this common reference that's necessary. And the Sears Roebuck people knew this 100 years ago. We don't need to scare the CEOs. The things that got them to where they are now are also the things that will bring them to the next level. We need to help them along. And we do that by encouraging them to seek out experts and support their work. You don't want to be afraid to ask stupid questions because there are no stupid questions. But there are a lot of stupid answers and those are the ones that you don't understand. Those are the ones that our community often gives to the CEOs. Goethe, the German poet, said, Es hört jeder doch nur, was er versteht. He only hears what he understands. And so what do we throw at people? Well, gosh. It's no wonder the business leaders are scared of us. Because this is the language that we speak. We've... It's not, not that we need to dumb down our message, but we do need to explain what we're talking about and not to take things for granted. Don't assume that they know what metadata is or what a wireframe is or what CSS is or what iOS is and why iOS is good for one platform but you need to do JavaScript if you're doing things for Android or why HTML5 is better than Flash. And they're saying, I don't know what either of those things are. Why would I care? But two-way communication needs to work both ways. Now, the business community isn't always very good with us either because they throw out things like this. Internal rate of return, uh, payback period, earnings before interest and tax. Excuse me? Yeah. So, we need to try and find some common ground with the people with whom we're working so that they understand what we're doing and we can help them to understand how we can help them achieve their business goals. So if in doubt, ask, always. This is a message to the CEOs, but it's also a message to you if 
some smart marketer or somebody is throwing things at you that you don't understand, ask. Last thing, don't hide in your office. This is uh, Sir Colin Marshall, or Lord Marshall of Knightsbridge. He was the CEO of British Airways, and I was doing service design things for British Airways and got to know Colin fairly well. And uh, he was responsible for taking a terrible airline, British Airways, and making it a very good airline. And the problem was that British Airways in the 1970s was a merger between BOAC and BEA. British European Airlines and British Overseas Airline Corporation. And they hated each other. They had been uh, competitors for years and years. And suddenly, the flight crews had to work together, and they didn't like each other. And Margaret Thatcher came in. I realize that's a terrible name to mention here. But anyway, so she decided to privatize British Airways. And Colin was the one who was supposed to put things in shape. So what happens is that in 1983, he joins British Airways. And in 1986, British Airways became Airline of the Year, mainly through our service program, which they're still using today. Now, there was a long period of success for British Airways. And by 1999, they had the largest fleet of 747s in the world. That is a major achievement, because I can tell you the metrics for an airline are if you have a 747, it has to be in the air 18 hours a day, and it has to be 80% full if you want to make any money. Those are the metrics for a 747. And if you have 100 of them, that's a lot of planes and a lot of passengers, a lot of moments of truth, a lot of user experience in order to get that many people to choose your airline. Now, in 2004, Colin, everybody was terrified of Colin because he was never in his office. He was always out there, and he was talking to the baggage crew. He was talking to the pilots. He was talking to the frontline personnel. He was making a real effort to understand the business and to understand where the pain points were within the system. He was a bloody marvelous CEO. Well, he retired in 2004. And they recruited somebody by the name of Willie Walsh, who came from Aer Lingus, the Irish Airlines. And he was a bean counter. And he slashed budgets, and he did this, and he did that. And there was too much money being used on service design, and there was too much money being used on this and that. And the result was that in 2009, he could not meet his payroll. It took him five years to destroy the company. And it took him another two years to reinstate all of the things that he had taken away. And now British Airways is a pretty decent airline again. So you have to be very, very careful. You do not want to stay in your office. You do want the CEOs need to get out there and understand. And you, as UX people, if you have to talk about hiking boots, then go out and find and talk to some hikers. Understand what's necessary for them. That's how we decide what content is. That's, why we, that's how we see the patterns that are going to make us successful. So demonstrate active support for the project and keep the whole team inspired forever. That's really what it's about. We're just glasses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.